מסכת בבא בתרא, דף מ, אמר רב ה, אמר רב נחמן, מחאה בפני שיניים, ואין צריך לומר כתובו. We discussed yesterday whether a protest, as there's a prior owner of a land, and now there's someone that's squatting on the land. So the prior owner needs to make a protest within the first three years, and uh, say, this is mine, he stole it, I'm going to bring him to court. We discussed yesterday whether this has to be in front of two people or three people, and Rava, in the name of Rav Nachman, is ruling that two people is sufficient as witnesses that will testify uh, later on. Yes, indeed, he made a protest, and therefore the Chazaka is invalid. And furthermore, he adds, the protester does not need to instruct the witnesses to write a document. It's a good idea to have a document because uh, who knows where the witnesses might be. They might not be able to find them. If they write a document and uh, says, uh, this guy uh, on this date made a protest and said that this land is his and the squatter stole it from him. So now he has a document that says so. Now these witnesses can write a document. Normally we would expect that the guy making the testimony in front of the witnesses has to make his declaration and instruct them to write a document on his behalf. But here, they don't, uh, he doesn't have to do that, and they can still write it. The reason is because, Zakin le'adam shelo befanav. We do something for someone else's benefit, even without them knowing, even without them saying that this is good for me. If I find, oh, see a watch in the street, and I know that you'll like the watch, I can pick it up on your behalf, and it's yours, even though you didn't ask me to do it, you don't even know that I'm doing it. And that's the same thing here. And now we go on to other things that also require witnesses and uh, see, do you have to tell the witnesses to write a document or not? Moda'a bifne shenayim ve'en sarich lomar ketobu. Moda'a, which we're going to discuss a lot more today, is a document of protest um, that's written before a transaction. Let's say tomorrow, you know the mafia is going to come and they're going to extort you to uh, sell, uh, sell them your car or your house and you don't want the sale to be valid. So what you do is the day before, you go in front of two people, that's what he says, and two people is sufficient, and you say, this thing that I'm going to do tomorrow is under duress, and I don't, I don't mean it. Okay, and they can write a, a document te- attesting to the fact that you protested beforehand, and you don't have to tell them that to write a document, again, this is for your benefit. You can use this later on and uh, come to court and say, I know that they have a document of sale and all that, but look, I protested beforehand. And so there are, therefore also, that is a merit to the person protesting so they can write it without his, his say-so. If someone comes and admits uh, that he owes money, Right, he goes in front of witnesses. Listen, I want to admit to you that I owe that person five hundred dollars. Um, in that case, because he's make, giving himself a liability, the witnesses cannot write it unless he instructs them to. We cannot assume that a person would want to have a document out there that says he owes money, because then the person that he owes money to can use that document to collect. And furthermore, even that the person who owes money his land will be lean, have a lien on it. Um, so a person may not want that. So therefore, the witness says they can listen to it, and unless the uh, the person making the admission says and write it down, they cannot assume that he wants it to be written down. So he has to say it explicitly. Kinyan bifne shenayim ve'en sadich lomar ketobu, and uh, to do a transaction, we're talking about a kinyan sudar. If I give you a handkerchief. And uh, by doing that, I acquire your car. This is a symbolic exchange. It's not worth, obviously, the same amount of money. And so unlike other types of kinyanim, if I would actually pay you money and drive your car away, then I acquire the car. And you don't need witnesses for that. That ha- This happens by the fact that I took your car or I, or I pulled your animal or whatever it is. But a kinyan sudar, because it's so symbolic, has to be done in front of two witnesses, like we do for a ketubah. Uh, where the, uh, the, re- the husband receives a handkerchief and gives over his obligation to the ketubah, and that's done in front of two witnesses to make sure that it's effectuated and also uh, to remember, uh, to testify that this was done afterwards. And in this case, the, um, the one that's uh, making that exchange 
does not have to tell them to write it. They can write a document on their own. We'll discuss this later because it seems that it's, it's making a liability for one of the people. If I give you a handkerchief and I get your car, I'm going to have to pay for the car. So I'm creating a liability for myself. And yet the witnesses can, can uh, write a document even without me asking them to. Or we'll come back to that. To ratify a legal document, you mean three people because you need a bet din, right? If someone comes and brings a document and says, hey, uh, you owe me a thousand dollars. So, well, well, let's ratify this first. Make sure you have signatures here. Uh, did these, did these people really sign it? So you have to bring it for in front of a bet din and the bet din will <clears throat> check the signatures check to make sure this is a valid document and it has to be done in, th- in front of three people because it's a ma'ase betin. It's a, uh, a, a legal process. Okay, siman mamhak, the uh, mnemonic for all those things that we just mentioned is mem mem hekuf um, uh, as mecha'am, oda'a, hoda'a, and kinyan. Good, Amar Rava. So Rava learned all those things from Rav Nachman. And now he has a question on just one of them. Ikasheli hakasheli. Hai kinyan hechi dame. Ikimase beti in dame. Libaye tilata. Ve'ila kimase beti in dame. Amai eno sarich lomar ketobu. Says, I have a, if I have a question, I have this question. Meaning for most of these, I understand that they're uh, uh, perfectly clear. But I have a question about the kinyan making an, uh, an exchange that says you need two witnesses and they, uh, they can write the uh, shtad on their own. So as well, what, what is going on here? Is this an act of the court? Then you would need three. So you, all, you said you all need two. So you, it's not an act of a court. And if it's not an act of a court, then how come you don't need to tell them to write a document? After all, isn't it creating a liability? I, uh, um, I, I gave you a handkerchief and I acquired your car and now we're going to have to pay for it. And they can go and write a document that they saw this transaction. And now you can use that document to say, hey, you have to pay me right uh, uh, $10,000 for your car. So how come they write it even without uh, an explicit directive to do so. Rabbi asked the question, and afterwards he thought of the answer as well. In fact, it's not an act of the court. You don't need a court to make a, a transaction of, a, of an exchange. You only need witnesses. And here, why is it that you don't have to tell the witnesses to write it, then they can write it on their own? Because we assume that uh, uh, without further specification, an acquisition is something that should be written. And that all parties want to write it. We're going to make a kinyan with an exchange now because we want to expedite the process and make sure we're committed to it. Um, and then the money will come later. But uh, um, when, uh, we're not expecting that either party is going to want to renege on the deal or deny it. So we want it to be written. We want, everybody wants it um, there. And uh, we, so therefore, since we assume that the witnesses can uh, write up a document even without anybody telling so, unless you tell them don't write a document, that would be a different story. Uh, so, Stam, we, we assume that people want such a document. So now we're going to go more into the second exa- uh, um, item on that list of a declaration of protest for something that will be upcoming. So Rabban of Yosef, they both say, you don't write a, a protest in all cases regarding all, all people, but rather we only will uh, um, write up a document of protest for concerning someone who will not listen to the judgment of the court of the Betin. So if I know that this mafia guy is coming to my store tomorrow and he's going to extort me for money, and going to, you know, uh, uh, take things from me, force me to sell, to sell him something. And this is a kind of guy who's a thug. And if I bring him to Betin, he's not going to care what the Betin says. He's not going to lose the Betin afterwards. Um, then they, they, uh, will, they will write me a document of protest. But if it's not a thug, let's say it's a, 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 good, uh, um, a good citizen who listens to the court. If he's brought to call to court, he's going to come. And if the court tells him something, he will follow what the court says. Then we don't write a document of protest in that case because I, I'll, I'll, I'll um, uh, uh, be involved in some kind of transaction that's forced I don't want. So don't write anything beforehand. Go through with this transaction, even though it's forced. And then afterwards, go, bring the person to Betin and explain to Betin, listen, I know I sold him this thing, but it was under duress. These were the circumstances. And the Betin will then uh, reverse it, take care of it, and make the guy pay, pay back. 
So if you can deal with it afterwards, then don't write a, pro, a document of protest before. However, disagreed with Rabba and Rav Yosef, they're the next generation students. And they say, no, we would write a document of protest even about me and you, Abaye and Rava, are good citizens. Obviously, they would certainly listen to a court. And nevertheless, if you were dealing even with someone who's God-fearing and will listen to the court, but they're, for some reason, they're, they, uh, they got you stuck into a deal that you don't want, you can write up a document of protest beforehand. Even though, well, you can bring them to court afterwards, but that's a pain. It takes a long time to bring them to court. They might have some kind of counter argument, and who knows, maybe it'll, there's no court nearby. And so since it'll be a hassle to do that, one is permitted to make a uh, write-up a document of protest, even if you're dealing with good citizens. The sages of Nahardea say that the protest document has to have written in it that the witnesses say, we are aware of the duress of this person. They have to say so. You can't just write a document of protest. Listen, I'm gonna, um, you know, get, I'm uh, writing a ketubah tomorrow. I'm getting married, uh, but I, I don't mean it, right? I don't want, it, I don't want it to go through. So that, that's not if, if it just if they just say it, the witnesses just say, oh, he said he doesn't want it to go through. That's not valid, right? You can't just undo everything that uh, that that comes your way uh, by saying that. You have they have to know that it's under duress. I'm not doing it because I'm being forced. Right? They put a gun to my head. They threaten my. They threaten violence, and that's why I'm writing it. But I don't really mean it. So, in other words, the witnesses have to know and have to write in the document the nature of the duress, and that that is the reason, not just because uh, I don't feel like uh, uh, paying tomorrow. Moda'a demai. So now we ask about that. What type of case are we talking about that this is a declaration of protest? Uh, so it, what kind of case? Is, is it a divorce or a gift? In that case, why do I have to say that it's under duress? Um, a, get, a get has to be given by the husband completely willingly, right? If there's any duress, then it's just not a get, not a valid get at all. Or even if he just doesn't want to, he doesn't have to, no one can force him to give a get. So if he goes to someone and says beforehand, I'm guess ending this get, but I don't want it to go through. Even without duress, that would be a valid protest. And the same thing with the gift. He doesn't, someone who gives a gift is not getting anything in return. And so as long as he says, I don't want this gift to be a valid gift. I know I'm going to hand it to him, but I'm telling you from now, it shouldn't be valid. Well, why? Is he holding a gun to your head? No, 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 no reason. There's no duress here. I just don't want it to happen. So this is just revealing, giluye milata, it's just revealing the matter. As long as I reveal that, I don't want this to happen since it's a, it's a one-way transaction. That's sufficient. And I wouldn't, I shouldn't have to say that it's also under duress. So that can't be the case that the sages of Nahardea were talking about. And if it's a sale, Rava says we don't write a declaration of protest for a sale. That, you know, it's a sale. I, got, I gave you the item. I got money. I did get something in exchange. And so even though there is uh, going to be duress, we don't. We say it's a sale and the sale is valid. Um, that's what Ava said. So what kind of case would it be that you have to make sure to write in the document that is, that is under duress? So in fact, we are talking about a case of a sale. You're right. If it was a gift or a get, then I don't have to say it was under duress. Um, if I just don't want it to happen, I say I don't want this to happen beforehand and then it doesn't, uh, it doesn't happen. Okay, so it's a case of a sale, but a specific one. And even Rava that says, in general, right, someone comes and says, hey, I'm buying this, uh, this nice uh, uh, cup that you have, right? And here's $10, and uh, he takes it. So that's a, val- that's a valid sale, um, even though I didn't want to do it because I got money. Uh, however, even Rava would agree 
about um, that you do make a, a protest document and you write in it that it's under duress in a case like the following case of an orchard. There was a case of a certain person who mortgaged out his orchard to someone else for three years. He got a loan and he said, here, you hang on to my um, uh, orchard for the following three years. Now this guy, who, who, gave, who the owner of the land, did not make a protest um, during those three years to say this is my land and it's only mortgaged. He should have done that. We learned that on previous pages. So after three years, the guy who was, who was uh, uh, squatting on the land the lender says, hey, listen, I now can claim a chazaka. Now, it's not true. He'd be lying and stealing. But nevertheless, if he comes, goes to Betin and says, oh, this guy sold it to me. I now have a chazaka. He would be believed. And so therefore, um, now he's going to use that, not, that uh, ability to take it as extortion. And the uh, lender says, if you sell it to me, then that's fine, all right, I'll, you, you, then, then I'll pay you for it, and at least you'll get some money from it. Um, but if not, if you don't agree to sell it to me, then I will hide the document of mortgage that says this is only for three years, and I will claim that I, that I bought, already bought it from you, and I have a chazakah, and I will be believed. Um, and so this is major extortion for a large amount of money for his whole orchard. Uh, it's a, a big property. And so in this case, even if I would agree that one writes a declaration, it's not like a, just a, a small thing when someone's going to come into your store and, and, and forcibly uh, uh, buy something uh, there. Okay, you're getting money. He got the item. So that, for that, you don't write it because it's a valid sale. But for something like this, where he's using underhanded extortion to use a chazaka against you and try to steal your land without paying for it, and then you're forced to sell your land, and it's a major loss in the case like that, Rava would agree that we write a chazak, we, we write a protest document, and that's the type of case that the sages of Narda were talking about. Amar Rav Yehuda, hai matanta temirta, la magvinan ba, hechi dame matanta temirta, Amar Rav Yosef, tamar lehu lesahadeh, zilu itamuru vechitbu le. Rav Yehuda rules that a, a concealed gift is not considered a, a valid gift. What does that mean, a concealed gift? Rav Yosef explains, if I go and tell two witnesses, listen, I want you to go hide yourselves in that little room over there and write a document that I am gifting this book that I own here to Mr. A. Um, that is not valid. Why? Because a gift has to be given in public. We are afraid that if I write this document um, in, in hiding uh, to Mr. A, and then I go take the very same book and I gift it or sell it, even worse, to Mr. B. So then Mr. B will think that he is the owner now. And if it's a sale, then even give me money for it. And then afterwards, we can produce this document that was written in hiding. It was in hiding, so nobody knew about it. Um, and I'll say, oh, but look, this date, the date on, on the gift to Mr. A is earlier. And therefore, that gift or that sale that I gave to Mr. B is null and void. And I'll be able to take it back. And so this is not good. It's going to lead to confusion and to people thinking that they got something, but they didn't really get it. And therefore, a, do a gift document has to be written by two witnesses in public so that then people will hear about it. Oh, did you hear? That guy, he gave his book to Mr. A. And then if I try to give it or sell it to someone else, they'll know that no, it was already given to someone else and they're not going to pay me for it. Okay. Vika de Amre Amar of Yosef. There's another version of uh, the same of Rav Yosef. Not that he said that go write it in, in private, in hiding, that that would be a concealed gift, but rather that he didn't say, the gift giver didn't say, to go outdoors in the marketplace, shuka is in the marketplace, um, ube baraita, and outside, this is the same word as baraita, which means a Tanaitic source that was, is outside, because it's not in the Mishnah. 
Uh, so it was excluded from the Mishnah. But here it means literally outside. Go out in the public area in the marketplace and write it. So what's the difference between this, the first version and second version of Rav Yosef? This difference would be, let's say I just told with two witnesses um, uh, to write a document that I'm giving this, uh, this book to Mr. A. I didn't say in hiding, and I also didn't say do it out in public. According to the first version, that would be a valid document because I didn't tell them to write it in a secret place. As long as I didn't say that, that's okay. According to the second version, I, in order for the gift document to be valid, I specifically have to say, go and write it in the public in the marketplace. If I said nothing, then it's an invalid document. Okay, either way, we see the point that a gift document has to have publicity. Ravah says, even though the document that's giving this the gift of the book to Mr. A is not valid, if I do, I go tell witnesses, write a document that I'm giving this gift of this book to Mr. A, and then I give it to Mr. B, well then, even though the first document cannot be used, the, Mr. A can't come and say, oh, it's mine, um, you, you wrote it as a gift because it was written in, in private. So even though the gift to Mr. A is not valid, nevertheless, that document can be used as a document of protest Bef- written before the sale or the gift to Mr. B, such that I don't have to give it to Mr. B either. So uh, usually, if you had a protest document, you'd um, you know you'd say, "Listen, uh, you know, uh, Mr. B is going to come and take this from me. It's under duress, or or I'm going to give it to him, and I don't mean it uh, mean to do so." So normally, you'd write a, an official document of protest. But if I was saying here that a concealed gift document can function as if it were. A, a document of protest, and there, uh, and if you do that, neither party, neither A nor B, will get it. A doesn't get it because it's a concealed document, and B doesn't get it because I can use that concealed document not to give it to A, but I can use it to protest the giving to B. Amara Papa, Rav Papa says that this statement that we quoted in the name of Rava. Rava did not actually say it explicitly. Rather, it was only inferred from something else that he did or said. This is a very interesting phrase. It comes up several times throughout Shas, and as it shows us that not sometimes when it says Rava said this, it means he literally taught those words. He taught it in a in a public lecture, and so it's recorded for all time. Uh, and some, but sometimes it's only an inference based on something else that he ruled or based on an, in a story that happened where, that he ruled in a certain case. And the student said, oh, it must be Ravah thinks that, but uh, he didn't say it explicitly. So what's the difference if he said it explicitly or we infer it? Well, if you infer it, sometimes the inference is not correct, right? That was not the reason that he ruled in a certain way. And that's exactly what's happening here. The Papa says this inference is not correct. Here's the story that happened that we thought that Rava said that. There was a certain man, and he wanted to do Kiddushin to a certain woman, and she said, if you write a document transferring all of your property to me, then I will agree to be your wife. But if you do not, then I will not agree to be your wife. All right. That's a very demanding uh, fiancé. So this guy, he really did want to marry her. So he wrote a document giving her all of his property. Uh, but he didn't give it to her yet. But then this man's oldest son, he already had a son, maybe from a previous marriage. His oldest son says, and that person, what will be of him? He means me. If he says, you know, dad, if you give away all of your property to this woman that you are betrothing, right? Congratulations. But what am I going to inherit? What are you going to leave for me? And so this husband, father, uh, had an idea. He went and told witnesses, go and hide yourself in a place called Avad Yemina. It's a place that had a lot of gardens, easy to hide. No one will see you there. Uh, generally, if you're writing a, a, a document, this is like, it's a public thing. You go, you get a scribe, you know, you're doing it outside. Um, and so here he says, go and hide in this place. 
and write that I want my property to go to my son. And write, he's going to do this before he writes and gives the document to his fiance. Um, so uh, he did so. And so the case came to Rava, and Rava says, nobody gets this property, it stays with the husband father. Um, uh, the son doesn't get it because this is a concealed gift. A document of a concealed gift is not a valid gift. And he said that the fiancé also does not get the, does not get it. Now, the students that heard this ruling, they assume that why is it not a valid um, a gift to the fiancé? Oh, must be because he first wrote a document regarding a concealed gift to his son, and even though the son doesn't get it because it's not a valid document when it's concealed, nevertheless, it does, uh, can function as a document of protest that the next thing that he's going to do, the document to his fiance, is not valid. That's what they thought. So the people that saw it thought that the reason why the second document to the fiance is no good is because the first document functions as a moda'a, as a document of protest. But that's not so. In fact, the reason there, in that case with the wife, that the, uh, the document to the fiancé was not valid is because the, it was self-evident from the circumstances that he only gave her all the property because he was forced to do so. Because she made this crazy demand, give me all your money or else I, I'm not going to marry you. So there it was obvious just on the face of it, even without any document to protest beforehand, that document was not valid. Um, and uh, so he was only forced to do so. So, uh, uh, so th that's why Rava said. So Rava said, the first document to your son is not valid because it was concealed, and the second one is not valid because it's evident that you were under duress and you didn't mean it. Um, and so uh, that's why Rava ruled such in that case. But you cannot infer um, uh, to another case that a, a concealed document can work as a protest. In a general case, it wouldn't be so. It could be that the gift giver um, wants to give the gift to Mr. B and not to Mr. A. That's why the first one that he gave, that he wrote, he said, do this in hiding because he didn't want it to go through. He did not want the gift to go to Mr. A. And he did want it to go to Mr. B and therefore it is a valid gift to Mr. B even though he wrote something to Mr. A beforehand as a concealed gift. That's not a protest in a general case. And so the Papa disagrees with the ruling. He disagrees that Rava even said that. Rava never said that. He only gave a ruling and the inference that people made was incorrect. Iba'yat lehu, last question. Setama mai, if someone just tells witnesses, write a document of a gift, I'm giving this book to Mr. A, and he doesn't say to do it in private and hiding, he also doesn't say to do it in public. He doesn't say anything. Is that a valid document or not? Ravina Amar la Chashinan. Ravashi Amar Chashinan. Velcheta Chashinan. Ravina says, we're not concerned that it's a concealed gift. It's valid. Ravashi says, we are concerned that this is what he meant. He says, you know, by not saying, go write it in public, he is, um, he is in effect uh, hinting that it should be in private. And so we are concerned as considered private. And the halacha is that we are concerned that this is considered a private document a private gift, and therefore the um, gift is not valid. Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen ve'amen.